a little bit of a glitchy start, but I think we are good to go now. Um, can everybody hear and see me? Uh, good on YouTube, good in Zoom and everything. Yep, we're all good. Excellent. Um, well, welcome. This is going to be a fun one. Um, this is this really cool like charcoal painting technique. It's one of those nice things that helps digital art feel less sterile and lifeless and just gives us this really warm, charming, traditional effect, but with all the convenience of digital media. So I hope you like this technique. I'll talk about just some philosophical stuff about what I think makes successful digital art, how to avoid some common pitfalls, and there are just kind of five little bullet pointed things that I want to discuss today. So I think this is gonna be really cool. Um, and Selene, are we seeing my document? Is this grizzled old dude showing up okay? He's looking great. Nice. All right. So what we need in order to do this is a charcoal texture. This is something I downloaded from, I think, Shutterstock. I actually paid like five bucks for this a few years ago. But there are some really good free examples on websites like pexels.com, P-E-X-E-L-S. So you don't have to pay for a paper texture. Uh, for this to work. But this is a really nice one that I like. So that is one of the key ingredients. Um, what we're going to do is, let me show you how this works because it, it doesn't really show up if there's no color. Um, I have my sketch ready to go beforehand. If you, uh, you don't have to do a portrait for this, but I always find this works really nicely with a portrait. Um, so I'm going to make a selection outside of the sketch and then select the inverse so that I can fill this in with a really dark silhouette color, something about like this. And actually, before I get too far along, I wanted to announce a few things. Um, we are currently doing enrollment for the spring session of Concept Art Academy. Uh, we still have spaces available. Uh, there will be a, a kind of a coupon I want to get about at the end of the stream today, but definitely wanted people to be aware that uh, enrollment is open. Uh, we will begin classes next Thursday, so uh, limited time, but space is still available. So if anybody is interested in a 12-week uh, Master Academy on concept art, uh, space is available. Uh, coupon code to come at the end of the stream. So back to what I was doing here, uh, just basically blocking in this sketch. And here's where this total hack, this is like the digital magic happens. We set this charcoal paper texture on our top of our layer stack to soft light. That is kind of the key to all of this. What that will let us do is paint underneath this charcoal texture and it will show up just like we are using chalk and charcoal. It looks incredibly natural and it just makes this really warm traditional type effect with all of the convenience and flexibility of Photoshop. So this is a really cool technique and it does a lot of really awesome things for our painting just artistically also. So that is kind of the main technical step is just using this simulated paper texture to kind of cover up a lot of the digital looking stuff. It, it sort of hides all of that behind this grainy texture. So I'm going to try and make this kind of moody and atmospheric. So I'm just dragging some gradients in from the edges here to kind of, I don't know, kind of sh uh, shining sort of a spotlight on our figure here. I think that's about right. 
Um, I want to barely be able to see the sketch. I, I want the sketch to pretty much disappear by the time that we are done with that. So that is item number one on our five things list is the paper texture. I'm going to merge the sketch and this silhouette so that we really just have this silhouette as its own thing. Next, let's talk about what brushes to use. Now, there are lots of brushes available on the internet that, that kind of promise the world, right? This is a perfect simulation of charcoal or perfect simulation of oil paint. Um, and digital brushes are fun. They can kind of be an exciting little boost to your progress, to your process. But I think for the most part, keeping things simple is better. I, I find that most of those brushes that, that overpromise things, that they never seem to really do exactly what I had hoped or what was really advertised. So other than just a little bit of smudging on the outer edges here, I'm gonna do this entire painting with the most basic Photoshop brush of all, which is just this round airbrush. That's really it. The paper texture does all of the work for us. It does all that nice expressive brushy quality without us really having to worry about that. So as I start to build up tones here, it's like we get all of the cool brushy expressiveness for free. The paper texture does that for us. We don't really have to worry about, you know, overlapping uh, something that looks like an oil paint brush or having our brush simulate some kind of texture or grain. We can paint with this incredibly simple and plain brush and the paper does the heavy lifting. I love it. So as I'm going here, uh, some brush settings that might be relevant is, I like to keep really low flow and opacity so that I can build up tone slowly. So one tap gives us a pretty light tone and I'm using this kind of highish key gray. Two taps makes it even lighter and three, four, five. So that you can see with that low flow and opacity, it, it gives us control. It lets us kind of build up the tones only where we want them to be. And kind of just general three dimensional lighting stuff. Uh, this is something we go over in a lot of detail in the academy, but the basics are, we're trying to think of this face in terms of planes, which surfaces of the face are facing upward towards a theoretical light source that I imagine to be kind of up here near the top of the canvas and planes that face away from that light source remain in shadow. So I'm just adding light where these planes face the light source. That's kind of a reductive view. That's kind of an over simulate, uh, simplification, but that is the basic idea. We are just thinking in terms of planes, in terms of light, what is facing that light source? What is facing away? Now, the other, or I guess I'll, I'll do a quick pause. Um, Celine, any questions or comments so far? Nothing yet? Uh, I would like to ask a question uh, about um, what if you want to create a character with a darker skin tone? Yeah. Would it work the same way with, uh, with this technique or, um, or what could we do about it? Absolutely. Um, and especially when we're only working tonally without color, um, 
practically nothing changes about the process. Uh, I find that characters with darker skin tones, it's, it's a matter of kind of obviously just lowering the entire range of values just a bit, but also higher contrast. When there is a darker local color, when the skin itself is a darker value, it really makes those nice highlights pop, um, which is why dark skin tones can be so beautiful to paint. Um, so the process is really the same, just a slightly lower general value, uh, you know, range. So for example, I, I could just sort of lower this entire um, value key with the hue saturation adjustment. So same exact process. Uh, if you try this, uh, I'd love to see your results too. Thank Great you. question. Hey, Hardy, I realized I was on mute. <laughs> oh, no problem. We do actually, we have a question from YouTube. Awesome. Uh, some, someone missed the beginning and they're wondering if you're erasing away the silhouette with an airbrush or adding on top of it. Oh, good question. Yes, this is a new layer on top of the silhouette. So I'm adding to it. Not, a, not erasing away, uh, but that, that's a good question. It kind of looks like I am. Um, it's sort of, it is and isn't just like painting or drawing with charcoal. Um, it's more like you're drawing with a white piece of chalk on charcoal paper because I am adding lights rather than, um, you know, with a stick of charcoal, all you can really do is make something darker, right? So it, the end result looks like a charcoal drawing, but it's sort of, a different um, kind of, it feels a little bit backwards in that way, but I always really like painting with light. I like kind of starting from a very dark ground and then it, it sort of feels like you're just flipping on the light switch. Uh, that, that's just the easiest way for me to kind of build these things up and understand things in terms of light. Uh, that works best for me. But another good question. And if anything is unclear, um, especially to the people here on Zoom kind of participating, feel free to just shout out questions. Um, I'm definitely used to that in our uh, weekly live classes at the Academy. These things always work best when it's kind of a discussion. So that's what we're here for. If, if anything I'm doing is unclear or if you have a question, just shout it out. But um, yeah, as I go, I'm just jumping all around, as you can see. I generally want one side of the face to be lighter, and then we kind of fade away to shadow. That slightly off-center lighting scheme is really cool and dramatic, which is our third point, um, using dramatic lighting. It's that super intense high contrast kind of a mugshot lighting that really fits with this character. Uh, I think I, I posted the practice run of this and called him the film noir detective, which I think this totally fits with. It, it gives that, um, that dramatic lighting that kind of evokes that whole genre and it just, uh, it makes it all look really moody and dramatic. And later I'm gonna do a little treatment to make it look like only part of his face is really in direct light. Um, makes it look like he's looking out of a window or something, really fits with those great um, evocative old films. So lots of fun stuff we're gonna do here with lighting, but just as a quick peek, let me show you how like airbrushy and uninteresting and computer generated this looks without the charcoal texture layer on. But once we add it back in, it's kind of amazing how much that texture just 
makes this kind of, I don't know, it, it gives it all of that charm of a traditional piece of art. A challenge with digital painting is that it's so clean and precise, unless we use lots of texture, that it's sort of like we have to, we have to detail things in insane levels of detail uh, in order for it to seem finished. Weirdly, if you hide things in texture, like this charcoal is doing it for us right now, um, it sort of lets you off the hook on that. You don't have to detail things so much. It lets the viewer kind of mentally connect the dots. Um, weirdly, over-polishing a digital painting can make it seem kind of lifeless. Uh, when someone is looking at your work, it's nice if it's sort of ill-defined in parts. There are little loose areas, brushy, expressive areas that, that kind of give that viewer a little unknown area, somewhere for them to connect the dots in their own mind. Uh, and that's sort of what this texture is doing for us here. It's like hiding all of this stuff a little bit. It's obscuring some of the detail. It's letting it just sort of turn into this uh, ill-defined um, texture. And that, that gives your viewer the, the space to kind of decide what they want it to be. I've also observed that when people kind of finish your painting for you in their own mind, they sort of take ownership of it and they tend to like it more. People like when things are what they thought it was. And when you give them that space to kind of invite them into your painting and let them decide what these little ill-defined zones are, that's kind of what's going on there. So it's kind of a, a, a deep philosophical stretch, but that's one of those things about digital painting that, that has been a really slow lesson for me to learn is that less is more. The more we can kind of suggest without really overtly showing, uh, the better the final result can often be. But yeah, just kind of jumping all around, trying to build up tones. Uh, but that, that power of suggestion, that was the fourth thing on my list here that I wanted to share. Uh, and it's really powerful. So less is more with digital painting. Keep things loose. Try not to let things get so um, smooth and computer generated and polished. And a lot of us coming from a traditional art background, we're so used to having to like just physically tame a traditional medium, like um, just making that charcoal gradient smooth or making that oil paint just behave the way you want it to. Um, we're so used to having to, to really work those things to get smooth effects that when we come to digital painting, we sort of overdo it. We overcompensate. Things become too smooth, too polished because suddenly we can do that. Um, so just because we can doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right thing. Got a little light kind of crossing over on this collar. And we're making some good progress here. Let me um, do a really simple hair rendering. Hair is another great, like less is more opportunity. If you find yourself in there rendering individual hair, um, odds are that it's just going to end up looking like, I don't know, so many overlapping lines. It just becomes really noisy and overly detailed. The hair becomes the only thing that your viewer can see, which is weird because when you observe a person in real life, you can see 
individual hairs on their head. But it's one of those times when we have to get a little impressionistic in our art, just let things kind of sit back a little and, and just be like a shape, uh, a suggestion, not, not an outright detailed thing. Uh, same is true of eyelashes I've found. Hey, Hardy, I've got a question for you. Yeah, totally. I am monologuing. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's my own curiosity. I was just uh, wondering why you flip your canvas every once in a while when you're when you're painting. That is an awesome question. I, uh, I do it without even thinking. Uh, that is a really good habit, I think, for a, an artist to be in. Um, it just sort of, well, it does a few good things. First of all, it's, it's easy for my hand to make diagonal marks kind of in this orientation. It becomes awkward if I try and sort of flip my elbow over and do it the other way. Um, so that's one advantage. It's because I was kind of moving the hair around, but it also does this nice thing of suddenly it makes the image like fresh in your mind. You can kind of, see it with new eyes. So if you, if something is bothering you about your painting, but you don't know what it is, usually if you flip your canvas, it instantly jumps out at you is, oh, wait, you know, the eye's too dark, or I accidentally, um, you know, made one, one nostril bigger than the other. Whatever little weirdness might be going on, it just jumps out at you. And I think that was actually a, um, a very old traditional art trick where uh, artists would, would hold up a mirror just to kind of see their work reflected and kind of look at it with fresh eyes, but really works. Uh, and I've set up a keyboard shortcut exactly for that. Cool. Um, let's see. Wow. Incredible. We're only 20 minutes in. Um, this goes so quickly and there's just really not that much work involved. Um, okay. One other absolute game changing concept for me about painting realistically, especially organic things like people or creatures is the idea of value edges. And what I mean by that is we need both kinds of edges, soft edges like this gradient on his forehead that's kind of curving around. It's, uh, it's basically like we have a sphere, right? Um, very soft gradient that is built up slowly to make something look round. And that's awesome. We want that roundness. It makes him look three-dimensional. But what we also absolutely need is hard value edges, places where light and dark kind of abruptly cut from one to the other. So this little corner of the eye right here, this is a great example, or the corner of the nostril. Any place where there is a sharp change in plane. So the nostril curves around here, but then it cuts really abruptly. Wherever that cut happens, we wanna see a very sharp change from light to dark, no softness at all. Same thing here on the nose, curves and then sharp turn. Um, where else? These wrinkles on the forehead, I could really needle in some some hard edges and it's just gonna look more and more realistic because it's places where these planes suddenly change. This little wrinkle kind of curves around and then suddenly curves into another one. So wherever we can kind of cut in these little hard, sharp edges, it always gives us this really awesome uh, boost in realism. I love that. And that, that single concept really changed my own work, especially when I kind of came over from drawing 
with real charcoal where I was, you know, whenever I could get a smooth gradient with actual charcoal, I was very proud of myself just because that was technically difficult. But I found once I had a Photoshop airbrush, all I was doing was making soft edges because I thought that's just the ultimate, you know, soft gradient. That's, that's just the greatest thing you can do. So remember those hard edges too. Uh, same thing here, this little cleft of the chin uh, where the lips meet. We go from dark to light pretty much on a dime. And that, that is a huge key, doing both. Uh, speaking of brushes, we actually got a flood of questions coming in. So I thought I'd uh, yeah. jump. Uh, someone's asking, uh, even with the charcoal texture helping, I assume there's more to avoiding that soft digital airbrush portrait look. Is it just variation in brush size that's doing that in this case? Um, somewhat. I, I am, you know, doing larger areas with a bigger brush, and then I was totally like needling in with a small one. Um, but one thing I should mention is that this brush has pin pressure set to brush size. So if I do a really um, small or a light touch of pressure, it gives us this really thin mark. But if I hammer down on it, uh, we get a bigger mark. So that gives me a lot of like dynamic control over this. Other than that, it, it's basically the low flow and opacity are letting me just do this really slowly. Uh, you know, we've been at it for about half an hour and I've probably jumped around to every corner of the face, you know, a dozen times by now. And that's just, that's the control that I'm after. It's, it's kind of making this happen slowly and, and kind of deciding where I want to build up and where I want to leave things dark. And it's just a really controlled process. But yeah, that there's really no more um, brush magic going on than that. So again, without the charcoal texture, I, I think this looks extremely Photoshoppy and computer generated. But um, with the charcoal, it looks pretty indistinguishable from a traditional charcoal drawing uh, to my eye. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure that could be uh, dissected and contradicted, but um, I think I think it's pretty convincing. Good question though. Uh, yeah, if there are other brush questions or, or any questions, I'm happy mm -hmm. to pause on that stuff. Okay, well, here's another brush related question. Um, sure. How to con how to control that undesired tone generated when two strokes overlap. Right. Um, so with a soft brush, look, even without the charcoal texture, that is actually, the softness kind of hides a lot of that. But if you look, I, I am actually, you can see a lot of that overlap. Um, the charcoal, hides that so much that it, it sort of just looks like one of those nice um, artistic imperfections that, that we're sort of counting on here. So the charcoal paper really uh, saves you on this, which is another thing that makes this a really cool thing to try is that it can give you a result that you can be really excited about you know, without, it forgives you for little overlap issues like that. It, it hides some of that stuff um, so that you can get a cool result and something you can be proud of that will make you want to paint more without, um, you know, making sure that every little overlap brush stroke is, is polished away. So uh, counting on the charcoal a lot for there. Hope, hope that answers that one. Okay, we've got a couple things related to light. Okay. Um, first one is how do you decide the direction of the light? And also I would like to know the difference between natural light and artificial light. Hmm, cool.
cool questions. Uh, the direction of the light is weird, is something that I almost always just go for something mostly above and a little bit off center. Um, if you light someone heavily from below, for example, it gives it that horror movie poster look. It's just kind of weird. So I pretty much never do that unless that's the effect I'm going for. Um, keeping the light off center does these really nice things of giving us kind of a lighter side of the face and then a darker side of the face. It lets, lets the nose kind of cast a shadow and it, it kind of just, um, I don't know, it makes things a little more dynamic when they are like out of balance in that way. If, if it was just perfectly symmetrically lit uh, right down the middle, it just tends to look a little bit boring. So, so just moving things a little bit off center um, with portraits like this, or I guess face concept art like this, or with characters, um, I, I usually like that one. As for artificial light versus natural light, actually, when it's tonal, like when it's just black and white like this, I, I don't really think of a difference. Um, when we're painting in color, that can have an impact um, because it it changes the kind of the color perception. If you are under a harsh fluorescent light, things can seem, the, the colors of skin tones can react very differently. So there are lots of dynamics with, with light and color. Um, you know, they teach semesters of color theory stuff in art school, uh, when you can get into just all the physics of where is light bouncing from. Um, you know, if you're, Outside, the ambient light is usually kind of a cool color because of the color of the sky. Uh, but then if you have direct sunlight on your face, it is a warmer color. So those two things kind of react. Um, it's interesting. Then light actually goes beneath the surface of your skin. It can make your skin kind of glow. If you've ever shined a flashlight on your hand, or if you've noticed how like baby Yoda's ear is always bright red near the tips. Um, it's something called subsurface scattering. It makes skin kind of glow in that sort of strange way. Um, so that is like this massive <laughs> topic, honestly. Um, but for a tonal painting like this, I don't think it really matters. Uh, this guy seems like he's inside somewhere just because it's so dark and there's such a local light. It, it kind of seems like he has a spotlight, you know, just barely outside of our field of view here. So it gives it this nice sort of mugshot look um, or makes it seem like He's in a basement kind of looking out of a window. It's sort of the, the final effect that I'm going to go for. Hope, hope that sort of answers that. Uh, light, light can be a really big topic. I'll need a, like a 10 hour podcast for that one. Looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have another one and it's, I think you kind of started explaining a little bit um, earlier. Okay. And, and it's around, um, how do you decide where to put the hard and soft shadows? Right. Um, great question. So that's, that's all about planes. Um, where is part of the face like curving? You know, where are these rounder kind of slowly arcing shapes of the face? You know, the forehead, this is a pretty simple roundish shape. So we have a very soft fade from light to dark. Um, the cheek, or I guess it was, but I have made this guy really gnarly and wrinkled. Um, but uh, let's say the bridge of the nose, pretty nice even cylinder lighting where we go from highlight to shadow. 
But anywhere where we have a sudden change in the plane of the face, like where does this surface make an abrupt change in its angle? Wherever that happens, we want a pretty sharp cut from light to dark. So corner of the nose, right? Big sudden change. Uh, corner of the eye, curves and then changes. So that's sort of the rule. If it's like, um, or the guideline, the idea. If it suddenly changes plane, you should have a sharp cut in value. But then you, you kind of want to immediately go from that sharp cut like we have here to something that fades away. And what's really nice about this brush I'm using is that with low pressure, I can kind of needle in these fine lines, these sharp cuts, but then I can, with the same brush, just kind of start fading that out. So this gives you a ton of control. And if you keep your opacity and flow low, it, uh, it makes you able to control that. One other thing I want to point out, uh, one of my academy students realized that their spacing for their brush had been on 1% kind of their whole painting career. Um, that is a really tight spacing that makes it hard to control. So make sure it's around 25% is about the magic spacing number if you are attempting this. So once more, that's when you open up your brush editor, that's under brush tip shape spacing and my shape dynamics size is set to pin pressure. Cool. Coming along. Uh, let's see. I feel like this guy's forehead would probably be more wrinkled. Looks like this guy has had a hard life. So let's uh Let's just make his face very haggard. This is the funnest possible type of face to paint, I think. When you need, when you are painting either, um, I don't know, kind of anybody, but there's a tendency to over describe facial features, make things look too wrinkled. And a lot of the time, that's not what we want to do, especially if we're painting somebody who needs to look young or beautiful. Uh, there, you, you have to use some restraint so that we don't over describe all of these nooks and crannies of the face. But when it is this kind of uh, aging man who has had a hard life, just the, the shackles are off. You can over describe everything and it just makes him look cooler and more uh, full of story. Just wonder what, you know, tough things this guy has seen in his life and it just makes it more interesting. Cool, all right, I'm gonna start my first new layer because I am going to um, do some eyes now. And I'm doing this on a separate layer just because I want to have some flexibility. If I, if I do something that I don't really like, um, I want to have the option to erase it and start over. So it's like I'm just setting myself a little safety net. But just starting with the whites of the eyes, I'm using the same color as the skin tone. And just slowly building those up again. I'm actually gonna sample a darker color for the first time. I'm using a different color um, and I haven't done that yet, just so that I can paint kind of a dark eyelash line on this upper eyelid. Eyelashes like hair are one of those things that it's best to simplify, I think. Keep it kind of impressionistic. Uh, let it just sort of read as a line instead of actually trying to, you know, individually show eyelashes, even if it's like a 
movie star uh, woman, we, we don't want the eyelashes to be super well-defined, uh, which is again, weird and counterintuitive because it seems like you can see individual eyelashes in reality. So why shouldn't we paint that way? And I don't really have the answer, but I just have found that to be true. Kind of a painting truism, one of these great less is more areas. I'm going to blur the line between the whites of the eyes and the lower eyelid. And this is always the fun part of the painting before we add the pupil where we have a zombie. Yay. But I think that's about right. Um, I want these to be kind of sunken back in shadow a little bit. So I'm having the eyelid cast a shadow on the whites of the eyes a little bit. And wow, this would be very creepy if I just stopped there. Let's keep going. All right, a uh, perfect circle for the iris of the eye. And I like to, oh, I made a new layer just so that I have the option of moving this around and changing where he's looking, which is uh, fun, but kind of creepy like if i just do this it's <laughs> it's like he's peeking around but um there's weirdly a lot of personality in this decision we make painting portraits um is he looking right at the camera is he like engaging us um that kind of makes them seem very confident or even confrontational um, are they looking off camera that can make them seem sort of uh, pensive like lost in thought which is really cool and i think that's what i'm going for with this guy he is sort of um you know in a moment of reflection and repose uh, but weirdly impactful decision. So uh, spend some time with that. I think I'm gonna leave his eyes pretty dark, but if you want him to have like, you know, really bright blue eyes, it's, it's pretty much just doing a little crescent moon shape in the bottom half of the eye, something like that. And then we just put this single bright highlight in the top half and pretty cool. But um, for this guy, I think I'm, I'm gonna stick with the darks. We still do need that highlight though. Even if eyes are dark, uh, we still have this shiny part on the front of the eye called the cornea that is transparent and it, it reflects light very brightly. So that's what that little um, twinkle is. Cool. We've got a question unrelated to Twinkles. Um, okay. <laughs> someone's I'm, I'm only accepting Twinkle questions at this time. No, that's awesome. Like, Go for it. When you when you drew the like the blue eyed version, I was thinking of the character from House, like the main the main actor in House, where he's kind of. I don't oh know. yeah. You know what I mean? It, it totally looked like him. Uh, Hugh Laurie, right? Hugh Laurie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This um, does have kind of a. Hugh Laurie vibe Just that was unintentional but I look that happens to me all the time where I thought I was making someone up and I was like well crap I just made Willem Dafoe for some reason didn't mean to but uh, that's awesome okay so the question is have you ever worked with 3d programs like ZBrush or Blender I never have um, and I think I'm going to have to start experimenting with that. Um, no, I am kind of just 
I've never really had a reason to, but I think things like that are going to become more and more a part of our concept art industry. So I don't personally use them, but um, they are definitely doing cool things. And uh, it's something I, I'm planning on. So no, not currently, but um, it's on my to-do list. Uh, a lot of my students do too, and they, uh, they're getting very cool results. Um, definitely, we can take more questions, but I just wanted to point out a technical step that I just did. I kind of grouped everything and made a copy of it so that I can merge all that we've done into one layer, uh, other than the charcoal texture. So we've got the character and the texture, and that's kind of it. Uh, I'm going to start kind of treating this more as like a one layer, you know, as if I were actually rubbing my hand on a sheet of charcoal paper to, to sort of finish this. And I, I can still see some sketch lines visible. So I'm smudging things around a little bit. This can be a nice way to sharpen up value edge treatment in a few places. So if I wanted this area under the nostril to be even more of a sharp turn, uh, smudging through it can really pull those tones out and, and make them even sharper. So um, that's kind of the step I'm at here, but it, it only really works when you have everything on one layer. But uh, I made a copy of it just so that I could go back. If, if there's something I do with this smudge step that I don't like, it's like I have the safety net. The layers are still there and I can go back if needed. Ooh, we've got um, a smudge related question. Perfect. Um, is there a specific technique slash smudge tool setting you use when you use the smudge tool and when you do decide when to use it or at which phase to use it at? Sorry. Um, cool. So this smudge brush is a pretty standard one. This, this kind of came out of the box with Photoshop. I think it's this one, just one of these. It's like lots of little specs that um, has some really simple dynamics set to it. It's just an angle jitter so that it's kind of random. <clears throat> That's kind of it. Um, those are the settings. Uh, as for when, yeah, it's sort of what we were talking about. Uh, I'm just trying to smudge away these sketch lines, especially in these darker spots. I don't, don't want to see those. I kind of want this to be purely a value painting. Like all we can really see here is light and dark. I don't want it to be about line very much. Um, was there a third part to that one? I think you pretty much had it. Is there a specific technique? Cool. Um, yeah. Not really. It's, uh, it's got pin pressure set again. So pressing firmly does make like a larger smudge, just like with the brush tool. But no, nothing terribly special going on there. It's just uh, kind of wherever you see something that you want to... Um, if you want it to be kind of less sharp, it, it's sort of a nice way to blur things out. And uh, it's also a nice way to move tone around. So if, if we want that value edge to be sharper, or let's say I didn't want this chin cleft to be such a sharp turn, I could just really smudge this and kind of feather that value edge and make it something softer. Uh, I'm going to hit undo so that we go back, but it's useful in that way. Uh, someone's asking, are painterly portraits typically done at a specific point in a concept arts pipeline? Um, I guess it all depends on the job you're working on, what, what your client needs. Um, and, you know, no to projects have really been alike for me in my career. Um, sometimes um, 
clients do want a very painterly portrait for certain parts of a video game. If there is some kind of dialogue where we really want to, you know, engage with a character, or if it's a character that's going to have a lot of speaking parts and their, their face is going to be a big feature in the video game, uh, you know, that is worth really spending some time defining this in detail. So it can be early in the process where we're just trying to create characters and describe them, you know, what do they feel like? What is their personality? How are they going to fit into the story? Or it can actually be something polished that is going to be used in the actual game as a painting. Um, one of my favorite artists is a French guy named Cédric Perret-Vernay, and I've probably never said his name right in my life, uh, but he's awesome. He did the portraits for the Dishonored games, uh, which are beautiful. If you never uh, played it, it's at least worth uh, searching for uh, the art in that game. And he actually, the, the art that he created would show up when a, when a player, when a character like was talking to you, their portrait would show up in the little dialogue pop up. So, you know, painting faces can be useful for a project in many different ways, purely as concept art, meaning like actually figuring out what we're doing for this pro project, exploration, or is actual in-game art as, a, as an asset, more like an illustration. So uh, another very good question. Um, adding some shadows here, by the way, I've added a new layer so that I can start darkening things. I am uh, coming back to my, um, Kind of we're, we're closing in on finishing here actually so i i want to do this really dramatic lighting scheme before we finish and yes sinking these eye sockets back trying to make his eye seem really sunken back um i think that's working pretty well make these ears very subdued and okay, we have about five minutes left. So this is kind of my final cool trick for this one. I'm gonna grab a pretty dark color. I've done a command click on the thumbnail of our character and that makes a selection for everything. And I'm just gonna fill in a dark color with, uh, by hitting option delete. Now, if I reduce the opacity of this, I want it to be like we can barely see him. It's like he is pretty much in shadow. And if we add a layer mask to this, that will let me hide this shadow layer in certain parts. And this is where we're gonna put this awesome like film noir stripe across his eyes. Like he's, I don't know, I imagine kind of looking out a basement window or just something super dark and brooding happening. Um, but isn't that cool? It just, it's like instant extra drama for practically nothing. That was a one minute step we just took there. And it, it just makes everything seem insanely more dramatic and cool. Nice. And that is pretty much it. Um, cool. Yeah, I'll call that one finished. I could noodle things like this forever, but I think at some point we just have to uh, call it about a solid hour. And I, I hope that technique is exciting and useful for a lot of you. It, it like it hides a lot of the things that are usually ugly with digital painting, so it can really feel like you are creating something amazing without a huge step up in brush technique or difficulty. 
So I hope you guys will try this. Just grab a charcoal texture image and follow these steps and I'll bet you'll get something amazing. Um, before we wrap up, and I'm happy to do uh, a few more questions at the very end, but I wanted to make everyone aware that uh, Concept Art Academy, we're, we're doing a special promotion with today's live event. There is a, I believe, 20% off coupon code that will be coming through and maybe a link as well. Um, so if anybody is, is an aspiring professional concept artist, uh, this program has really been amazing. It's genuinely transformative. Uh, so our spring session will be our final one before summer. And uh, I would love to add a few of our attendees to, to the group. So check that out if you are interested. It's an awesome program and, and we've got an awesome group of artists assembled so far. So take advantage of, of that offer. One other thing I've got going on is this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I am going to be a guest teacher on the Evident platform. Uh, and I'm going to be doing a two-day character concept art workshop. So it's uh, two hours on Saturday, two hours on Sunday, and enrollment is open for that as well. But uh, reach out to us anytime on Digital Painting Studio if I can help. Um, I love talking with artists and helping them kind of take their next steps, achieve their goals, whatever they might be. So consider me a resource. Uh, but that's my speech. I hope you enjoyed the demo. And um, Selene, any, any questions before we sign off? Um, I just put, just so everyone knows, I put the code and the uh, links to everything in the chat, and we'll also email it to you after this. Um, and someone is actually asking, will there be any art challenges in the next couple of weeks? Yes, uh, totally. Actually, now that we've done the live or we're almost done, uh, that's my next order of business. I am thinking either robots or spaceships. Um, we've done faces and monsters for the last two and they've been awesome. So I'm going to get started on that. It might be a couple of weeks before I have new ones ready, but, um, definitely going to stick with the five and five challenges. Those have been amazing. So coming soon. Um, cool. I think we'll go ahead and wrap up there, but, uh, yeah, reach out at digital painting studio. If I can ever help anybody. Thanks for coming today. This has been a blast and I hope it was useful. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Celine. Bye, guys.